Today, what I'll talk is about explaining and uh, verifying AI systems, which has become um, an important topic recently with the deployment of AI systems in the real world. Uh, there is now a need to understand the decisions that are being made by these systems. Why did they make a decision? And also before deployment, we may need to verify their properties, prove that they're gonna work well and they have uh, the, the desired properties. So that, that's that been uh, coming into um, uh, a lot of focus recently. In fact, in the United States, there is a major DARPA effort. Uh, DARPA is one of the main funding agencies, and there is a DARPA program called uh, XAI, Explainable AI, which is dedicated to the subject of, uh, you know, explanations. And this actually slide is directly from the website of that program, and basically uh, kind of highlight uh, the realities today, right? So we're um, using machine learning systems, but they tend to be obeyed. Um, not intuitive and difficult for people to understand, and we use them in these applications, and, and, and these are some of the questions that people are, are now asking, right? Uh, when the system makes a decision, why did you do that? Uh, why not something else, and so on. The, the next slide shows the, the current practice and how it works, right? So you have some, uh, when building kind of the mainstream systems today, which are the machine learning systems, so you have some training data, you, do some learning, and then you <coughs> learn a function. Now, this learned function is, a, is an important term that, as you'll see throughout the, the talk, in the sense that the box that we eventually learn and use in practice <coughs> is just a box that maps some inputs to outputs. And what we want to try to do is explain that particular function. So the next slide uh, has perhaps the, the major insight behind our approach for explanation. So this is an example of a, a machine learning system, uh, or what's known as a classifier. It is uh, a type of a Bayesian network, uh, known as a naive Bayesian network. It is meant to uh, classify patients into pregnant or not. So you have uh, three tests that you can do a urine test, a blood test, and a scanning test. And then you get these results, or some of them. And then you compute the probability of pregnancy. And if this probability crosses a certain threshold, let's say 90%, it's higher, then you would say, OK, this patient is pregnant. I'm classifying them as pregnant. Otherwise, not pregnant. Um, this structure is what's known as the naive base structure. And what these numbers do is uh, quantify the relationship between the features or the test and what we call the class variable. So they represent the false positive and negative rates in this particular case. This is a special type of a more general uh, kind of model called the Bayesian network. I'm not sure how familiar people are with this. Uh, and the first part of the talk will actually focus on these kind of uh, machine learning models. Now, the point is, you learn this from data. So you come up with this structure but then you learn these numbers from data. And then in practice, you use this model to do classification by doing probabilistic inference, by asserting evidence on these, computing posterior probability on that, and then making a decision. But if you think about the system overall, it is actually a discrete system in the following sense. When I use this, I'm giving you the values of three variables. That's discrete input, right? And the final output of the system is a yes, pregnant, no, not pregnant. So if you box it this way, that whole thing, even though it's a numeric, it is actually a specification of a discrete function. That was learned from data. Now, why is that important? Because what we will do in our approach, I'm going to try to compile this machine learning system into a symbolic representation that capture that discrete function. And then I'm going to use symbolic methods on that symbolic representation to do the analysis I want, in including explanation and verification. And you'll see once you do that, you will have a wealth of techniques available for you, classical computer science techniques from verification and from a classical AI. And in our approach, what we're going to do is we're going to capture this function using a decision graph very familiar 
I, I think most people know decision trees, right? The decision graph is just like a decision tree, except that you can have multiple parents per node, right? So in this case, this decision graph, in fact, was compiled from this naive base classifier. And it's guaranteed to reach the same decisions like this one. So for example, if you come and tell me, I have a patient and they tested positive for the urine test, negative for the blood test, and negative for the scanning test. And I want you to tell me, are they pregnant or not? You can do this in two ways. You can come to this guy, assert this evidence, compute posterior probability, check the threshold, or simply use this guy by saying, I'm here. The urine test is positive, so I'll go this way. The blood test is negative, I'll go this way. That you get no. This guy is telling you they're not pregnant. You're guaranteed if you were to do it on this side, you'll get the same answer. The decision graph is a generalization of the decision tree in the sense that, as I said, you can have some portions that are shared. That, in general, means that the decision graph could be exponentially smaller than a decision tree. So it's a more compact representation. And in fact, this is not just a decision graph. It's what we call an ordered decision graph, meaning the, the, the features are tested always in the same order across any path. This is going to be important because that makes these uh, graphs tractable, meaning many queries can be answered on them very efficiently. Right? So our approach actually compiles Bayesian network classifiers into these guys. And <coughs> as you may know, people can learn these directly from data. Right? They can learn decision trees, but they're not as, as good as what you're going to get here. So it's better to learn a probabilistic model and then compile it to this instead of learning it from data. When we say we're going to do explanation, we're not going to be doing visual inspection of these things. We're going to be applying algorithms to them, and I'll show you that next. Because the decision graphs that we will compile are not going to be small enough that you can look at them and know what's going on. They will have hundreds, thousands, and in some cases, millions of nodes. So they have to be analyzed um, automatically. Uh, by the way, interestingly enough, the compilation of naive base classifiers, just that restricted class to decision graphs, was done about 15 years ago with my student Hei Chen, who's currently in Japan. Uh, nobody paid attention at that point. <laughs> right? So uh, recently, just this year in HKI, we generalized this algorithm to three uh, classifiers. And more recently, with uh, my student Andy Shi, we actually uh, now can do arbitrary classifiers, arbitrary structures. So we can compile uh, any network structure uh, into these things. OK, so now what I'm going to do next is, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about the compilation algorithm. Uh, what I will go into next is, what can you do once you have the decision graph? But if people later want to hear about how the compilation algorithm works, I'll be happy to, <clears throat> to tell you. But I'm going to assume we got this guy. And again, we call it order decision diagram. And, and next, I'll show you what can you do in heaven once you get one of these graphs. And <clears throat> just show you a few networks that we used in, in our experiments that I will, and, and some of the examples I'll show you later. This is a Bayesian network from the um, domain of educational testing. Uh, this was developed by a group in Prague, with, I think in collaboration with some group in Finland. Uh, it, it, it's trying to assess the competence of students. Uh, math skills. Uh, you can think of these as the different skills that the student has. And these are the features, which are questions, the beliefs that they have to answer. So the idea is, as I ask the students questions, they get the answers. I assert the answers as evidence. I compute the posteriors over these. And then based on that, I will make an assessment. So what this <coughs> network is, it's, it's actually three classifiers. Right? You can think of each root node as its own classifier. So when I compile this, I give you three decision graphs. One for this, one for this, and one for that. And this is another network that we used from Microsoft Research for diagnosing printing problems. Uh, and the third one we used, uh, again, the ones I'm going to be mentioning later, is a, a Bayesian network for diagnosing breast cancer based on uh, uh, mammography reports. And this is from Stanford Medical Informatics. Uh, that was developed. Again, these are the, the uh, 
the evidence variables, and this is the, the class variable, as they call it, in which uh, we used to do the, OK. So just before we start, let me give you a sense. When you compile these into decision graphs, what we found is the sizes really vary. Uh, this was one of the surprising ones. This is the last one. When we compiled this, we got a small decision that that's the whole thing. It only has 156 nodes, the decision graph that correspond to that classifier. But we found that sometimes the same classifier with the similar sizes, they can lead to decision graphs that can have hundreds or thousands or sometimes millions of nodes, because that all depends on the underlying logic and the numbers in the, in the classifier. And just to give you a sense, we, we just, like our first algorithm, very recent, a uh, few months old, uh, we could at, at this point get something like 40 features. So we could, we could uh, successfully compile classifiers that have up to 40 features. Uh, which is interesting. Again, this, this is the full uh, uh, graph unlabeled for the cancer network. OK. Now, what can you do once you have these uh, decision uh, the graphs for the classifiers? So the first thing we did is explanation. And the explanation means the following. Again, you, you, you use the classifier. You say, I have this instance. And the classifier says, I'm classifying this way. And then you ask the question, why did you do that? All right? So. We came up with two types of, class, uh, of explanations. And this was just published at, at Ichkai in Sweden uh, this, uh, summer, this summer. Uh, one thing we call the MC explanation. And this is oriented more towards what's known as monotonic classifiers. I'll explain what a mono monotonic classifier uh, is in a little bit. But let's assume all of the features are either positive or negative. So they're either on or off, right? And <clears throat> And let's assume that the more positive features you have, the more you're going to be making a positive decisions. And negative features push for a negative decision. So this explanation says, the classifier says, I'm classifying this instance positively. And then you ask why. And then it will try to find the smallest number of positive features that are responsible for the decision. That means if you keep these, you can flip all of the others to negative, and the decision will not change. Right? I'll show you a concrete example in just a little bit. And there's another type of explanations that we propose, which is more general. <clears throat> it does not require or is not targeted towards monotonic classifiers. In this case, it's called PI explanations. Let's say you have 30 features. right? You observe their values. You make a classification. And I say, why did you do that? What this guy will do will find you the smallest set of features. doesn't matter whether they're on or off or what their values are, the smallest set. That if you fix, you can do whatever you want with the other features, and the decision will not change. That means it is this small subset of features that are responsible for your decisions, and the others are all, in a way, irrelevant. This can be very important in practice. So let's take an example. <clears throat> the, the classifier I showed you for pregnancy is simple enough. There's only three features, and they're binary. So there's really eight possible instances in this case. And let's, let's, so in this case, we went ahead and generated the explanation. But I'll illustrate one of you more concretely. So this is a patient, Susan. And she tested positive for both for scanning blood and urine. All of these came out positive. And then the classifier says pregnant. And then you ask, why did you conclude that Susan is pregnant? If you use the explanation that I just showed, the MC explanation, what you get back is because the scanning test came out positive. Look what happened here. There are three things that are positive. But the explanation says because the scanning test came out positive. What does that mean? That means the other two tests could have been negative. And I would still classify Susan as pregnant. So out of these three, only this guy is the reason for the decision. OK? This is interesting. Now, when you have too many features, uh, you can imagine how important this is. Let me show you another example a little bit more complex. Sally tested negative for scanning blood and urine. So all features came out negative, right? This classifier will classify, uh, oh, it should be Sally, not Susan. Why did you conclude that Sally is not pregnant? OK, look what, what's the explanation. <clears throat> because the scanning test and one of the blood and urine came out negative. So all of them are negative. But what this guy says, if the scanning test is negative and one of these are negative, I will 
classify the instance as negative. I don't need them both. It's just sufficient for one of them. And, and it's also telling you that if only scanning is negative, no, I would not classify negative. I need scanning, and I need one of these two. Right? That's the explanation that you get out of this. The interesting thing is you can compute these explanations in linear time on the decision graph. What I'm going to do next is just quickly illustrate that process. This is just a run through how you can compute an explanation just to give you a sense. If you were to implement this in practice, what do you have to do? What we do is we're going to try to illustrate a positive instance. And I want to try to explain this. The first step is you, you can convert the decision graph into a Boolean circuit, just like, as you know, in digital logic and in ORs. And that's easy, straightforward. What does that mean, the conversion? That means if you give me an instance like this, on, off, on, and, and you want to know if it's positive or negative, you, you basically evaluate the circuit by setting these into zeros and ones and evaluating. If you get a one here, that means positive instance, right? Otherwise, it's not positive. So it, it is an, an equivalent representation for the uh, positive instances. And then the algorithm runs on this. Now, you can run it directly on the decision graph, but that's, that's how we're doing it here. You, you do several steps. The first step is we condition the circuit on the negative features. This is like just flipping some of these guys into constant. And then you do something that we call, we compute minimum cardinality. And that basically pushes some numbers up while you're doing either minimization uh, or summation at different nodes. Again, I'm not explaining the details, but it's, it's a bottom up pass. And then you do something called pruning, which is you cut some of the edges. And then you basically get your explanation. Again, I didn't explain what we're doing here, but my point is the algorithm is just a few passes on the circuit, and you get your explanation. Each pass is linear. Right? Trying to start a collaboration with a group that does uh, medical monitoring. Right? What these guys do is they try to monitor patients that came out of the hospital, and they want to try to predict how likely it is that they will be readmitted by monitoring their signs. Now, imagine a system like this using classifier and then saying, oh, I think they're likely to be admitted. But then using this to say, and the reason why is the following. So they may be monitoring, what, 20, 30 different features. But then they come back and say, it's these two features are the reason why I'm predicting that they will be. And all of this can be implemented very nicely. Now, uh, <clears throat> in unit time, the compilation algorithm is more, more complex. But once you have the decision graph, OK, so well, this is another example uh, that we used about admissions into college, but I'm going to skip this. I want to say a few words on what else can you do um, once you have these decision graphs from a verification point of view. And then in the second part, I'll tell you more about what you're doing on other types of AI systems, in particular neural networks. So initially, we did explanations, and then we realize that we can also do verification. Verification is you come and say, I want to make sure that my classifier has the following properties, and then we try to verify them. Uh, I will just give you example, one example property, which is monotonicity. So what is a monotone classifier? <clears throat> Intuitively, if a positive instance a positive instance remains positive even if we flip some features from negative to positive. So formally, but then I'll give you a concrete example. So here's an instance. Uh, this feature came up positive, negative, negative, positive. And uh, we classified this positively. That then all of these are guaranteed to be positive. So look at these two guys. I'm flipping some of them to positive, and, and the instance remain positive. OK, where does this come up? Here's an example. Educational testing. So let's say Susan had a certain number of correct answers. You have 50 questions, and Susan answered 37 of these correctly, right? And then the classifier said, oh, she's competent. She passes. Now, if you have Jack, and Jack answered those 37 questions correctly, plus two more. Now, clearly, you have to classify Jack also as competent. It, it would be <laughs> weird in this case if you say that he's not competent. Right? He answered the exact same questions of Susan plus one. That's, that's basically monotonicity. So in this case, you want the classifier to be monotonic. And if it's not, it's, it's problematic. 
So uh, it turns out that you can do this in quadratic time once you have uh, the, the classifier. And interestingly, in this case, I showed you an example of an educational network before. Uh, we used threshold of half. And in fact, we found that the classifier is not monotonic. And uh, we were able to produce uh, counter examples. Now, if you use a different threshold, uh, then it may become uh, monotonic. So you can use, you can think of the tools that you have here as a tool that can help you debug and refine your classifier by finding the right threshold. Now, the cancer network, we did not come up with the threshold. According to this that that paper, the threshold of 0 0.02 was used, which comes from medical uh, standards on things. And we still found out that it's not monotonic. In fact, the counter example we came up with was a bit uh, strange. We, we were able to identify two patients. They have the same mammography report, except for a feature called personal history. Do you have a personal history of cancer or not? And guess what? The patient that has a personal history was classified as benign, not pregnant, uh, not uh, cancer. And the one that has no personal history was malignant, which is weird, right? Uh, you can do more things, uh, but I'm not going to talk about these. In, in the paper that is cited up there, uh, we could check robustness. What does robustness mean? Robustness is you have an instance, and, and the classifier comes up with a decision. I say I'm classifying it this way. Right? So let's say I have 50 features. <clears throat> robustness query says, what is the smallest number of features you have to flip so that you can change your decision? So you, we can do this also efficiently. The, if the answer is seven, it's not bad. It's a robust decision, right? Seven features have to change before you can. But sometimes you get an answer of one. <laughs> you can flip one feature and then the decision will change then you look, wait a minute <laughs> before i commit and, and make something big i want to try okay this is robustness you can do this very efficiently once you have the symbolic representation of the classifier but what if the features very critical yeah the feature yeah the feature is critical so if you flip that feature the, the, the decision will change right now the question is our job is to tell you one feature can change your mind. But then from there on, what do you do? It's up to you, right? So you may look and say, that makes sense, right? And I'm OK. Or you can look at this and say, wait a minute, no. <laughs> this is a volatile thing. So from there, we just give you that information, and you have to decide what to do with it, right? But the point is we give you that information very efficiently. So we're giving you eyes. You can see through your system, but that's just the beginning then you have to follow up with more work on your side. Any other questions? Because I'm going to now change subjects in a way, because I'm, I'm going to go into neural networks.